In today's video, we're going over the treatments of bicipital tendinopathy. Ah! All right, so in today's video, we're gonna go over some treatment strategies for patients that have bicipital tendinopathy. We're gonna go over some recommendations from McDevitt et al. in 2024. Before we start and say, hey, these are the best evidence-based treatments for bicipital tendinopathy, I just wanna let you know that even in the study, they said that we don't have great research for this condition. And the other piece is that they were drawing some of their um, guidelines from consensus statements, basically based around expert opinion. We all know how good expert opinion is when we're trying to figure out what treatments can be best for any condition, right? Let alone bicipital tendinopathy. So we're going to be going over patient education. We're gonna go over exercise for the rotator cuff and scapula, so scapular muscles. We're gonna go over specific exercise for the long head of the biceps tendon, which is usually what is irritated in bicipital tendinopathy. And lastly, the authors recommended manual therapies for these folks as well. Now, I've already done a very in-depth video about manual therapies for folks that have subacromial pain. That is going to apply for this population as well. I'll leave a link in the show notes so you guys can check that out if you'd like to. So a few anatomical considerations before we get going that I think are important to understand because it's going to apply directly to the exercise you choose for your patients. So we have a scapula here. This is the collarbone or clavicle. This is a humerus or the arm bone. Essentially, the bicep is going to attach here. There's two heads of the bicep. You have the short head and the long head. The long head of the biceps is typically what becomes painful. Essentially, the biceps comes up and it goes right through the bicipital groove right in this area. This is typically where folks are going to end up having pain. Now, what's interesting about the long head of the bicep is it comes across, it crosses the shoulder joint up over the top and attaches to the glenoid on the superior labrum. So when folks have biceps pathology, oftentimes they actually have pathology of either the biceps where it attaches, they have slap pathology, which is going to be a labral injury, superior uh, portion of the, uh, excuse me, the labrum, or they have biceps tendinopathy, which is going to be right in this groove right here, okay? Now, what's interesting about the long head of the bicep is we don't truly know its entire function, all right? So the long head of the biceps, because it actually crosses the shoulder joint, may play a role in shoulder stability. And the reason why we think this is the case is because when we have rotator cuff pathology, it's often associated with long head of the biceps pathology. So if we're not getting great control of the rotator cuff, maybe that leads to the long head of the biceps getting damaged as well. You also see folks that have pathology of the rotator cuff, they will have more activity of the long head of the biceps. So maybe the long head of the biceps is trying to make up for a lack of activity from the rotator cuff. So the long head of the biceps is obviously going to be active when we do any sort of elbow flexion, any sort of supination, but it's also gonna be active in the first zero to 30 degrees of shoulder flexion because it crosses over the shoulder joint. So when we give exercises to our patients, we can give them shoulder flexion exercises, we can give them biceps, just elbow flexion exercises, and when we give them shoulder exercise, we should probably make sure they're working in that range between zero and 30. Now this is a complete anecdote, but when patients come to me and they have bicipital tendinopathy, or we diagnose them, we think they have bicipital tendinopathy, usually what hurts most is going to be bench press and pressing exercises, particularly as we get to the bottom part of the bench press. And we think about the bottom part of a bench press, as I descend, 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 I'm pretty close in that zero to 30 degree range. This means two things. So for one, early on, when you wanna modify your patient's training, you might wanna think about reducing the range of motion in their pressing exercises. We'll talk about this more in a minute. The other piece is that when we're selecting exercises to target the long head of the biceps tendon, we might wanna use shoulder flexion exercises and focus on that zero to 30 range, because you know that's when they, this muscle is going to be most active. Hey there. Pardon the interruption, but I have something that's going to change your entire life. Well, not really, but it's probably going to help you get really good at treating your patients that have bicipital tendinopathy. And lo and behold, I present the Evans Space Cheat Sheet for treating bicipital tendinopathy. Ah. And in this astounding cheat sheet, I'm going to get you completely up to date on the research about bicipital tendinopathy under 10 minutes. I don't know, Dan, 10 minutes, that's not a lot of time. I know that, and we'll get you up to date. It's gonna happen. Staying up to date in all the literature on biceps tendinopathy is as tough as working in coal mines. Oh, well, it's not really that hard, but it is a pain in the butt. So I've done the work for you, and I put all the information in this handy dandy little cheat sheet. We go over the function of the long head of the biceps, differential diagnosis, clinical examination, mechanism of injury, and the best treatments for this common pathology. I tell you what, learning is going to be so much fun. 
Here's the thing, it's also very, very cheap. Coming in at a whopping $0.00, otherwise known as free. So I'm gonna leave a link in the description below. Go ahead and click on that and go get your evidence-based guide to bicipital tendinopathy and go get your learn on. All right, so the first thing we educate our patients about is patient education. We know this is helpful for folks that have shoulder pain. So what are you going to educate your patient about? Well, for one, Jackson, I know you really flared up the long head of the biceps. This has a positive prognosis. So you wanna let your patients know that over the course of time with exercise, these tend to do really well. And it's just important that your patients understand that. The second piece is you wanna modify your activities. And this is going to be regular activities throughout the course of life, so ADLs. It's also gonna be your training, okay? So largely, if your patient hurts a lot doing that overhead activities, oftentimes these folks hurt when they're putting on a jacket, either this way, going behind their back, reaching across their body, like they're turning the steering wheel. We basically want to modify those activities temporarily so don't aggravate the area. I tell my patients all the time, that if you have a rock in your shoe and you keep walking and it hurts a lot, and you take ibuprofen, it makes the pain go away, but you keep on walking and the rock is still in your shoe, you're never gonna get better, right? You gotta take the rock out. So if we stop aggravating this thing on a regular basis, it really allows the pain to go down, down, down. The other piece that's often provocative is going to be sleeping, right? And if you're a stomach sleeper and love to sleep with your arm overhead, this can be a big issue. But I think it's worthwhile to go over some sleeping uh, positions that work well for patients, particularly laying on your back or laying on your side with a pillow underneath your arm. If patients have a hard time kind of moving around throughout the course of the night, I recommend using a body pillow. So essentially the body pillow kind of keeps you in place so when you wake up, you're not basically in the position that kind of hurts your shoulder all the time. Okay, the next thing that's important is your patients are gonna to have to modify their training in the gym, right? So what does that mean? What's okay from a pain perspective? What exercise can we kind of push through? So we have a little bit of guidance on this, not necessarily study in the biceps, but other parts of the body. And I like to use the pain monitoring model. This was popularized by Karin Silbernagel. Essentially, they had two groups of individuals with Achilles tendinopathy. One group was allowed to push through some pain, how much pain is acceptable, four out of 10 or less. With a caveat, the next day your pain is kind of back to your baseline. So if you have a patient that has shoulder pain, you go to the gym, you try some exercises, and essentially all those exercises are less than a five out of 10, so four to 10 or less. And the next day their pain is back to the baseline, great. So what we're trying to do is keep the training as similar as possible as what it's supposed to be. So if you're supposed to do bench press, have your bench press, that's a five, and you actually have some pain, but it's within those parameters, and the next day you're back to baseline, I don't think you need to modify it, right? But if you're doing bench press and it feels god awful, right? So eight out of 10 pain, next day your pain is flared way up, that's a problem. We're gonna need to modify those movements, okay? One of the easiest ways to do this, like we said previously, is to shorten the range of motion. There's no longer wrapping the biceps tendon around the humeral head. So if you take the range of motion, just shorten it a little bit, folks often feel really good. So I'll give you an example here. We have Jackson laying on his back. He's got his elbows on the table. So the thing about a floor press, is a dumbbell floor press, you can't go deep into shoulder extension, where oftentimes this is kind of painful and provocative. So you can perform his pressing here, and we're training the chest, we're training the shoulders, maybe not as well as we normally would with the barbell bench press, but we're actually not aggravating the area, hopefully, and over the course of time, we're doing two things. We're choosing an exercise that still pushes him towards his training goals. The second piece is if you do this modification appropriately, you're actually rehabilitating your athletes at the same time, okay? We're always trying to hit two birds with one stone if we can. I also have some really in-depth videos on how to modify the bench press and the overhead press when your patients have shoulder pain. I will leave those videos, link in the description, and we'll kind of move on to treating bicipital tendinopathy. All right, so next we want some exercises that are gonna directly target the long head of the biceps, right? We just talked about how the long head of the biceps is most active between zero and 30. Anecdotally, most of my athletes that are pressing the gym, they hurt in the bottom part of the bench press. So what I wanna do, I wanna target the tissue with the issue. I don't want to avoid the muscles that are painful. I actually want to target them. And the way we can do this for long head of the bicep is by performing a bit of a, a fly exercise. So essentially, we're gonna have Jackson here, and he's going to supinate, just so the biceps is gonna be in a position to produce some force, and he's gonna have his hands, I'd say about 30 to 45 degrees into abduction. And from here, he's gonna start around 30 to 45, and he's gonna descend into some shoulder extension, and then come right back up to the starting position, okay? It's a weird exercise, but we're training the long head of the biceps, right? We're in that zero to 30. We're going a little bit deeper, which is a range that anecdotally, a lot of lifters don't really tolerate well. We're building some strength and some stability there. We can also do the same exact thing with cables. Generally speaking, we take the cable, set it nice and low. It's kind of low pulley. 
And then from here, we try to supinate, just put the biceps in a good position to produce force. Can't see too well here, but Jackson is actually in a little bit of extension, right? So his shoulder is back here a little bit. And go ahead and perform one of the flies. Yep, we'll go about halfway up and halfway down. Now, typically when you do a pec fly, you go up all the way, you flex the pec. But just keep in mind, we're not trying to target the pecs here. We're trying to target the long head of the biceps. So I really like this exercise for folks that have bicipital tendinopathy. So McDevitt also recommended performing some bicep exercises focusing on elbow flexion, right? So all of your basic curl variations are probably going to be a decent idea. So we're gonna form these dumbbells, barbells. Let's go ahead and do a few repetitions here, all the way back down again. So we know we're training the biceps when we do this. They're probably good to include some curl variations in your program. There's a lot of research to show that when you're doing your bicep curls, go ahead and do a few for me, Jackson. One of the ways to really increase EMG activity of the long head of the biceps is by putting this finger out just like this. And when you do that, it's a good idea to take your phone, fitness pain free channel, and then go ahead, come on up, hit that like button, right? Second rep, subscribe. And on the third, go ahead, hit some comments. So maybe high reps is a good idea. Just make sure you have enough to send a comment. Yep, help that algorithm out, perfect. I also like to use some combo exercises, meaning that we're focusing on elbow flexion as well as shoulder flexion at the same time. Think about your classic uppercut test, which is supposed to be a test for the long head of the biceps pathology. We're basically reproducing that to try to stress this area positively so we can have some good adaptations. So essentially, we're still setting up in a fly position with the pulleys nice and low. And from here, again, supinating at the elbow, and we're in a little bit of shoulder extension to start. And from here, Jackson is going to simultaneously perform a little bit of flexion with a curl at the same time. So we're working the long head of the biceps at the shoulder as well as at the elbow. We can kind of do the same thing with an incline curl. So essentially, you just have a patient, you set the bench up on an incline, and from here, just let your arms relax by your sides, Jackson. So already a little bit of hyperextension. We're probably wrapping the long head of the biceps around the humerus a little bit in this position. And what we're do here is we're going to do a curl, but we're also going to flex the shoulder a little bit. Yep. So you can see right here, we're working both the elbow as well as the shoulder, and we're probably targeting that long head of the biceps really well. And the last thing the McDevitt article recommended was going to be some sort of exercise for the rotator cuff as well as the scapular muscles. I mentioned this previously, but when folks have rotator cuff pathology, oftentimes the long head of the bicep is gonna be a little more active. So the thought is that if you stabilize the shoulder, stabilize the rotator cuff, the long head of the biceps doesn't take as much stress, right? Now, I did a really in-depth video on my favorite exercise for the rotator cuff, scapular muscles for folks who have rotator cuff related pain. You wanna make sure you include some of those exercises. I'm gonna leave a link in the corner. Go ahead and click on that video and I will see you there.